to reach out uh, people uh, in Europe, but all around the world. Um, by the way, I uh, would be uh, happy if you uh, would like to become uh, Code Week ambassadors, because uh, being a grassroots initiative, uh, we basically um, are a network of volunteers who are called the Code Week Ambassadors. And then there are uh, another network, a parallel networks of uh, so-called leading teachers because uh, Europe Code Week is mainly uh, focusing on schools uh, just because uh, it is uh, very uh, important to reach out uh, kids when they are at school during school hours in order not to um, to leave someone behind because otherwise if we um, focus only on uh, after hour after school activities uh, we risk uh, to uh, reach people who are already aware at least uh, of what coding means so the idea is uh, to try as much as possible to involve the schools and this can only be done by involving teachers and that's uh, the reason why um, since 2018, we, we established a network of teachers called leading teachers in order for them to be of inspiration for other teachers in their own countries. And this is working pretty well, even if 2020 was like a little bit a stop, as you can imagine, because <laughs> of the pandemic. But nevertheless, uh, we, we managed to reach out uh, about 4 million people during uh, Code Week. So this is more or less the, the size of the initiative. And it is also very, uh, I would say, um, highly pushed by the European Commission, even if it is not uh, uh, an initiative by the European Commission but it is supported to some extent. We have no legal entity, so we are just a network of volunteers. And this makes also the initiative very open because uh, having no legal entities is very uh, difficult to establish a formal partnership, but very, very easy to establish a de facto partnership with Europe Code Week. So I, I really, would like to invite uh, all of you to take part in it uh, and any form of cooperation is more than welcome. And there are no, no limitations and no constraints apart from the fact of uh, uh, basically willing to contribute to the success of Code Week, that's it, which is uh, meant to uh, introduce coding, but uh, not just for the sake of it, but as a, as a mean for um, helping developing computational thinking skills, basically. That's great. All the numbers of uh, Alessandro is always huge, huge, huge numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, as a matter of this fact, is not, he... This is, not, uh, this is not me, this is... Uh, quite a, a big network of volunteers yes and he he is developing another project right now mm -hmm. I, it, it's called the trip yeah that's an amazing idea and i asked him not to present it at this time because he has a lot to to tell us but maybe in another time he explain uh, what he did yeah, I could the... also send you some links uh, and uh, I've, actually I have something uh, written in English uh, to explain uh, what uh, Code Trip is. So I um, will be happy to share uh, a draft of a paper to um, with the community if uh, if you like to have a look of it. Sure, for sure. Uh, because he involved, he engaged thousands of students and teachers around the country in Italy. And it's a, an amazing idea. We could try uh, in our countries too. Because yeah, it it's would also be very nice to try to make uh, international uh, coded trips. So this is kind of, a, oh. of an online school trip. 
but it is organized as a, as a real school trip. So it is uh, not perceived as uh, being uh, uh, too much virtual, you know, uh, because we take care also of all uh, the um, social aspects uh, and uh, the logistics, uh, which are in part simulated and in part real. And the, what makes it uh, very amusing for kids is the fact that they are together, not alone, uh, because they take part of it together with their classmates, but they participate in something bigger without mobility, but with a lot of other, of other um, schools uh, all around Italy. So in the last uh, events that I made, and the school trip lasts for two days, so we, we were online for about 15 hours uh, in uh, each edition, but without being uh, continuously online. So this is just uh, the, the actual um, duration uh, of the live events uh, that, we, that we conducted. Everything uh, happens live, so it is highly interactive. And uh, we developed a tool that uh, allowed thousands of people uh, to interact um, without any limitation on the number of participants. Uh, uh, schools can register for free. It is completely um, free of charge for all the participants. And in uh, the, um, the last uh, editions, we, um, we had uh, 40,000 kids for each trip and they all interacted <laughs> all together they managed to to draw something all together just by uh, pointing uh, uh, on their screens uh, and we collected all the points of a lot of <laughs> very amusing and rewarding <laughs> especially rewarding uh, uh, activities so i'll be happy to share okay so Thanks. i think that we can start yes we... yes yes i think we can start it now so first of all thank you very much i can uh, share uh, the screen i prepared a few slides actually not a few a lot of slides but they are uh, very informal so i would like just uh, to show them to you in order uh, to allow you to stop me and point on some specific uh, um, slide or topic because uh, I'd like, uh, uh, sorry, this is not the right one. Here it is. Okay. 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 So um, I decided to take uh, this uh, multidisciplinary approach just because uh, I um, run a MOOC uh, in the last month, uh, which um, involved a lot of uh, colleagues of mine uh, with different competencies uh, uh, in order to try to provide uh, a multifaceted uh, view of artificial intelligence. And this is more or less the, the number of topics that we covered. So we started investigating what human intelligence is. Then we moved to machine intelligence, uh, looking in particular uh, and starting from the war by Alan Turing. Then we had a couple of contributions on uh, utopian and dystopian fiction on artificial intelligence and robots uh, just to to see how uh, this uh, topic uh, was uh, treated in literature and in, uh, in cinema. Then we uh, investigated the um, artificial intelligence mechanisms, so the main mechanism behind artificial intelligence. Then we um, had a, a, a section of the MOOC devoted to coding and artificial intelligence, and in particular I will uh, uh, try to um, deepen a little bit on that. Then we had several contribution uh, uh, providing the state of the art in artificial intelligence. Uh, and finally, uh, the last section devoted to ethics uh, and uh, socioeconomic aspects. Um, so what I'd like to, to do today is uh, to try to provide an overview 
of the many aspects that were treated uh, and then uh, try to discuss with you um, something that I uh, that I like to make it as simple as possible, which is the way in which uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, um, sprout almost from nothing, from something which is not intelligence, uh, intelligent at all, which is an ideal performer, a computer or a robot. So let me try to uh, provide first the overview. So as for uh, human intelligence, uh, this was investigated uh, from several uh, different perspectives. Uh, and the first one was what is called the neuroarchaeology. Neuroarchaeology is by itself uh, an interdisciplinary uh, topic, which uh, brings together prehistoric archaeology, where uh, there are evidence uh, mainly based on archaeological uh, finds uh, like uh, scores, uh, artifacts uh, and traces of uh, human beings. Um, there are also anthropologists involved uh, that try to, um, to understand um, which were the habits uh, of the first uh, hominid just by looking at the evidence provided by the archaeologists. Then there are neuropsychologists involved, who are the ones who try to understand how the brain functions. And then there are also some um, other biologists involved in trying to understand the brain evolution from a phylogenetic point of view. And what is nice of neuroarchaeology is that uh, if they bring uh, all these findings together, they can cross validate their models uh, and come out with something uh, which is uh, much more solid as a theory than uh, each uh, of the single branches by itself. And um, in particular, Fabio Martini, who is a prehistoric archaeologist, uh, and Fabio Macciardi, who is a neurophysiologist, uh, provided a lot of evidence uh, uh, who were, uh, which were cross-validated, uh, uh, bringing together and putting together all these kind of aspects. And this was very, very nice because um, what they basically demonstrated uh, is that by looking at the evidence uh, of the ability of the first human beings uh, and on at the same time uh, uh, looking at the shape and size of their scores and at the same time uh, looking at the phylogenetic uh, um, trees of the genes involved in the brain evolution, they uh, were able to assess that the functionality of the brain and the ability that the first human being developed had evidences on this kind of evolution and even on the appearance of new genes. One of the most important one was the one that basically delayed our uh, own growth. So what I mean is that uh, human beings uh, become adult much uh, more slowly than many other animals. And this is because of a gene that appeared in the history of uh, human beings uh, when there was this kind of cultural explosion, making us able to learn a lot because, uh, because before actually becoming adults. And this, uh, which uh, could um, uh, look as a disadvantage, uh, actually was uh, a, um, a competitive advantage for uh, Homo sapiens. 
Then the other uh, perspective uh, on uh, human intelligence was uh, that of cognitive sciences, uh, where uh, we put together psychometrics, uh, psychology and education, and in particular looking uh, at language production and comprehension, and neurophysiology, uh, where we uh, investigated was what consciousness is, and uh, even uh, how to measure it uh, in um, even in patients who are, uh, who are called the locked in because they um, have diseases that um, avoid them for uh, um, making any kind of um, external uh, uh, communication. So this was done by Manuela Berlingeri, Mirta Vernice, and Mario Rosanova who covered the, the three competencies uh, in order to provide um, a perspective of cognitive sciences uh, and uh, of working memory and executive functions uh, together with our ability to learn a language. Then we moved uh, to the second part to machine intelligence. And once we tried to define what human intelligence is, we looked at the world by Alan Turing, uh, according to um, an historical perspective uh, and the, also a philosophical perspective, thanks to Vincenzo Fano. And uh, the work by Alan Turing uh, made a lot of sense uh, uh, in light of the attempt to define what intelligence is. Uh, and of course, there is no um, ultimate definition of what is intelligence because there are many different forms of intelligence. But one of the results of the first part of the MOOC was that uh, um, intelligence is uh, always defined uh, according to some task to accomplish. And in particular, when we try to provide a measure of intelligence, uh, we uh, need always to have some task. And if you think of it a little bit, uh, it is quite strange because intelligence is not necessarily something that uh, we uh, put in place uh, when we have to accomplish a task. Intelligence should be something that exists independently of a task to accomplish. But when we try to define what intelligence is, we always um, come out with some form of task that uh, defines a performance with respect to the accomplishment of this task. In the third part of the MOOC, uh, we had two contributions, one uh, from uh, Alessandra Kalanki and the other one from Dom uh, Holdaway, who uh, provided an overview of the history of Anglo-American literature and the history of cinema in order to um, basically discuss how the artificial intelligence uh, uh, and also the topic uh, um, regarding robots, uh, even uh, before artificial intelligence, uh, was uh, um, predicting something that really happened, or in some other cases, uh, uh, focusing on something completely different and possibly completely wrong, or not yet, uh, um, not yet reached by the development uh, of this uh, technology. Um, one of the uh, main uh, um, distinguishing features uh, of all the, um, the work in literature and uh, also the movies is that uh, um, robots are perceived as uh, servants that at some point uh, um, dismiss their uh, role and try to uh, create a conflict with human beings. And this is something that uh, uh, can be basically uh, well expressed by using uh, 
the, the main uh, laws of robotics by Isaac Asimov, because um, more or less uh, um, most of the contributions that we find in literature and in cinema uh, can be uh, reconducted to these fairly simple laws that basically assess that robots uh, has to serve, have to serve humans uh, and uh, to uh, avoid um, impairing or creating any damage to human beings. Then in the fourth part of the MOOC, we focused on um, artificial intelligence mechanisms. And uh, for each of them, uh, we had a biologist uh, providing uh, the model, the metaphor that inspired the mechanism, and then a computer scientist uh, um, explaining uh, what uh, the method is. And starting from machine learning, we had a contribution uh, uh, by Carmen Belacchi who um, focused on educational psychology to um, basically uh, explain what learning means. And then uh, Valerio Freschi, uh, who took uh, the computer science perspective uh, by illustrating uh, the machine learning techniques. The same uh, approach was taken from new, for neural networks, uh, where we had a, a neurophysiologist, uh, Stefano Sartini, who provided a model of the brain, the neurons, uh, the axons, uh, dendrites, uh, and uh, the firing of neurons uh, and the way in which uh, the synapses are formed and destroyed in order to provide the biological model who inspired artificial neural networks that were then uh, explained uh, again by Valerio Freschi. And then we took uh, another perspective. Here I didn't put numbers because this uh, uh, didn't uh, fit into the MOOC for the lack of time because we had to finish the MOOC before having uh, um, basically covered the, all uh, the topics, which was uh, genetic algorithms uh, treated from uh, an evolution theory standpoint and then from a computer uh, science standpoint. As for the coding part, that uh, was my, my part, and then this is the part where I uh, will uh, spend uh, uh, a little bit more time today. Um, I tried to um, start from the very beginning and with the idea of an ideal performer, which is uh, either a computer or a robot, which uh, does nothing but what we ask it to do and try to uh, understand at which point this ideal performer can become an artificial intelligence uh, entity able to take autonomous decisions. And then I will uh, go very briefly later um, at the end of this presentation um, on these uh, five steps that were um, treated in five uh, um, different lectures. So I will uh, uh, summarize them very quickly at the end. So the idea was that starting from the ideal performer, um, we had to uh, provide some kind of context awareness to it uh, and in order to make it able to adapt to the environment because Without uh, adaptation, uh, it is uh, very difficult to, to, um, to seem uh, intelligent for uh, a computer. Then we, um, uh, we try to look uh, at what can be perceived as free will, thanks to some form of non-determinism or pseudo-random uh, generation. Then we uh, focused on uh, uh, brute force, uh, which is um, enabled by the execution speed of uh, today's computers. And then we try to um, see what happens uh, when we move to uh, machine learning, uh, thanks 
to some form of learning capability provided by the machine to the machine. In the sixth part, we had uh, four contributions uh, that provided um, an overview of uh, artificial intelligence today. And the first one was made by Andrea Basso and Leonardo Chiariglione. By the way, Leonardo Chiariglione is the um, leader of the team uh, who in the 80s uh, developed uh, the MPEG standards. And uh, what is interesting is that they are right now trying to make uh, a similar effort for standardizing in, uh, artificial intelligence modules in order to uh, enable a free market of artificial intelligence modules that can be used and composed, but uh, making them as transparent as possible in order to make them explainable. Because one of the um, of the new topics in artificial intelligence is what is called uh, explainability because uh, since machines are now able to learn from experience and tend to take uh, pseudo autonomous decisions the problem is that the acceptance of these decisions from a uh, human being depends on the way in which uh, the rationale behind these decisions can be explained and this can be explained uh, uh, only if we know at least which is the main structure of the artificial intelligence system uh, that is taking uh, a decision. Um, then we had a, a lecture by Mirko Musolesi on art and creativity and in particular what is called the generative deep learning uh, uh, which um, makes uh, a, a fairly strange and uh, creative usage of deep learning by reversing the neural networks that uh, usually provide some form of classification. And since neural networks, we will see them later on, usually take inputs and try to classify uh, inputs based on uh, examples uh, that, they, that they had during a training phase in order to make uh, uh, artificial intelligence able to create something, uh, these kind of neural networks are basically reversed in order to allow the system to create uh, artificial inputs uh, that correspond to the desired classification. And this makes artificial intelligence entities uh, able, for instance, uh, to create uh, images that does not exist uh, starting from a description of what we want them to represent. Then uh, Pietro Leo uh, provided a lecture, gave a lecture on Excuse proactive... Excuse me uh, a moment, Alessandro. Uh, I don't know if I understand very well this art and creativity, uh, but um, I remember one experiment uh, people uh, made recently they, with music. Yep. They took, uh, they gave an input of many, many, many musics, uh, yes. uh, classical music. And then the computer uh, analyzed what are the best, uh, the high points of all of them. And they, then the computer created a, a, a music. Uh, is that one example? I don't know. Of yes, absolutely. What... absolutely. There, are, there are examples in uh, any form of art, so music, uh, um, there are uh, movies, uh, there are pictures, uh, there are um, in particular writings uh, that can be made uh, artificially by a, a, an artificial intelligence entity. And all of them uh, are um, so some of them uh, are uh, nonsense. <laughs> there are many, uh, many experiments uh, making a, a computer to um, write something uh, or to generate uh, images. And sometimes uh, these images or the writing uh, doesn't make any sense, don't make any sense. But there are other uh, experiments uh, which are uh, much more impressive 
where uh, computers create something uh, that exactly correspond to a description, but what they create does not exist. So they create it from scratch. So for instance, there is a very, very nice uh, uh, piece of work where uh, you can uh, input uh, a description of an image that you, that you want to, to see and the computer creates it, but uh, it creates it so realistically that uh, it looks uh, like a picture. And for instance, you can say something uh, like, uh, I would like to see a, a chair which uh, looks like a banana and the computer creates uh, a, a chair which, uh, which has a shape of banana and uh, it looks like a real chair. And you know, <laughs> this, is, this is something that is uh, really, really, really impressive. And those are all uh, open tools that can be tested online. So it is uh, even uh, quite amusing to play with them. Some other, but what I mean is that uh, usually Artificial intelligence entities, uh, and in particular uh, neural networks, uh, are used to solve problems uh, or to classify something according to examples uh, that are provided during uh, a training phase. So what happens is that uh, if uh, you uh, manage to um, basically train a neural network uh, in order to provide a proper classification of the inputs uh, that uh, the neural network gets, at some point, uh, in principle, you could ask the neural, the same neural network uh, to create inputs uh, that will be classified according to the examples provided. And that's, in principle, of course, this is uh, nothing technical what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not uh, explaining how it works. But uh, the principle behind it uh, is that uh, once we are able to classify something, in principle, we are also able to create something that does not exist, but belongs to the same class. Okay, so this is more or less the idea. Okay. So it's like uh, asking a computer to create inputs that will, would be classified as if they were real. And if the network uh, was uh, very well trained, then these inputs will be very, very realistic. There are so... also other um, applications of this, which are the ones that allow you to improve the resolution of an image. If you take a picture and you lower the resolution, then this is not uh, reversible since uh, you cannot uh, increase the resolution of a picture, but thanks to artificial intelligence, you can. Needless to say, if there were artifacts that were uh, unpredictable, those artifacts uh, uh, won't be in the regenerated image. But if you take uh, a, a picture of a building or uh, a landscape or something like that, and you zoom in, zoom in, and zoom in, artificial intelligence systems can uh, provide a very good resolution, uh, even if you keep zooming in, uh, uh, well uh, beyond the actual resolution of the image that you took. And this is a form of generative artificial intelligence as well. While proactive artificial intelligence uh, is the one uh, which uh, prevents our needs. Um, this is especially used for uh, healthcare applications, uh, but also for personal assistance. Uh, in many cases, uh, uh, they provide uh, not just advices, but also um, possible uh, solutions or uh, alerts or alarms uh, without uh, being asked for. And uh, Capillar Artificial Intelligence, uh, who was uh, um, described by Danilo Pau from uh, ST Microelectronics, uh, um, is Another uh, very interesting piece of work, because uh, when we uh, think about artificial intelligence, we usually think at uh, cloud systems uh, where there are no uh, limitation on the amount of data and computational resources. So usually uh, there are so many data 
when we use Google, for instance, <laughs> even uh, for Google search or whatever, uh, we or for uh, Google Translate, uh, we usually um, take advantage of a lot of data, of big data that can be processed by a lot of servers uh, simultaneously. While uh, there are uh, many applications uh, that uh, um, cannot uh, wait for signals uh, to go up and down from the cloud. And the idea of capillary artificial intelligence is to make artificial intelligence as close as possible to the sensors, so to the origin of data, rather than gathering big data and then performing processing on the cloud. And this is a completely different topic because in this case, constraints are very, very tight because in this case, we have what is called the microcontrollers, not uh, huge uh, uh, server farms and microcontrollers are tiny. They cost uh, a few dollars or less than one dollar. They have no memory. They have no computational resources. They are slow. So the challenge is uh, making artificial intelligence work, even in this case, uh, in order to make it capillary and not just a center as it usually is. And then the final uh, session of the MOOC was uh, on ethics, economy, and society. And for ethics, uh, we had uh, four very, very interesting contributions. One on uh, clinical psychology by Claudia Chiavarino, philosophy of science by Teresa Numerico, political philosophy by Cristiano Maria Bellei, and sociology by uh, Giovanni Bocciartieri. And I'd like to, um, to point out just one of the contributions, the results that they provided, um, which is uh, the fact that uh, um, machines are biased as we are. So what I mean is that uh, once machines uh, become able to learn from experience, they also learn stereotypes and biases because we uh, provide them those stereotypes. And there are many examples uh, in which uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, entities took, uh, um, I would say, unfair decisions uh, uh, just because of the bias of the training set that was provided even uh, unadvisedly. So this is not necessarily something that we do uh, because we want to do, but uh, even without uh, paying too much attention to it, we result in providing examples that, uh, um, that are um, by themselves uh, affected by stereotypes or uh, uh, gender inequalities uh, or uh, any kind of discrimination. And uh, what is uh, worse is that uh, once we train an artificial intelligence system, then these kind of stereotypes uh, and gaps become part of its code. And then they will uh, uh, reiterate this kind of uh, inequalities just because uh, they have it uh, in their own uh, uh, system, which uh, after the training phase uh, becomes uh, uh, part of the code. It's not uh, something that is uh, able to adapt um, any longer. And the reason why uh, we cannot, uh, uh, in many applications, we cannot allow machines to keep learning from experience is the risk of losing control of them and providing no guarantee to the final users because uh, uh, there is, uh, and this is the last uh, part of the, of the MOOC, there is uh, a need for regulation for artificial intelligence. And here we had the two contributions, one by Lucilla Scioli, who is the director of the European Commission for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Market. And the other one by Gabriele Marra, who is a professor in criminal law, uh, about uh, two very interesting uh, 
topics. The first one is that uh, regulation uh, is needed not to limit the market, uh, but to um, create uh, the um, conditions for uh, large scale adoption and condition is trust. So if, if, if there are no regulation and we uh, cannot trust artificial intelligence firms, uh, then adoption is limited. While if there is a, a, a good regulation, which uh, does not uh, impair the uh, development of technology, but just um, tries to um, basically to provide guarantees to end users uh, and to adopters uh, on the way in which uh, the artificial intelligence systems were tested and produced uh, and, and trained, then the adoption would be probably, um, probably faster than without a regulation. And this is a, a, still a, under discussion. So the um, regulatory framework uh, in Europe is uh, the first international attempt to create uh, such a framework. It, it is still under discussion, but there are many very interesting topics around it. While uh, the contribution from the criminal law perspective uh, is, um, is also very interesting because at some point uh, the criminal law assumes that there is a responsible for any decision uh, which uh, resulted in a crime. But the point is that if machines are able to um, take autonomous decisions, if one of these decisions uh, result in a crime, who is responsible of it? The one who created the system, the one who uh, provided the training set to the system, or the one who decided to use it, or the machine. So the, um, I would say that the most uh, fascinating perspective is the case in which the machine is considered to be irresponsible. Because in my opinion, um, when Gabriele Marra gave uh, his lecture, I, I realized that, that this perspective that I uh, so it was just uh, a, side, um, a side topic uh, on artificial intelligence could be one of the main ones. Because uh, when we started discussing what artificial intelligence is, um, we didn't uh, focus on uh, the responsibility of the machines. But on the other hand, uh, if we think that uh, um, artificial intelligence entities can uh, uh, actually um, provide some uh, real form of intelligence uh, and become able to take autonomous de decisions. At some point, uh, we have to ask ourselves, but are we uh, ready to consider them responsible for those decisions? or we still have to find a human being who is responsible for their decisions. If uh, we, we need to find a human being, uh, probably we are saying uh, that artificial intelligence is not a strong intelligence. It's just uh, uh, a system, an artificial system that tries to mimic uh, some uh, uh, intelligent behavior of human beings, but is not by itself uh, able to take uh, such autonomous decisions. So this is a very uh, tricky uh, argument uh, that I would like to uh, investigate uh, in uh, deeper detail, uh, but this was just uh, to provide an overview of the many different disciplines that can uh, be uh, put together to try to um, appreciate the many facets of this topic. And to conclude this, uh, this webinar, I'd like to go very quickly to a fairly simple arguments starting from scratch and by using uh, Kodirobi, which is the simplest, uh, probably the simplest and the 
uh, most trivial uh, um, tool, well, method for uh, uh, unplugged coding. So Robby is a paper robot con conceived to move on a checkered board as a piece, uh, if it, uh, as if it was uh, on a board game. And uh, Robby is uh, this uh, piece here. This is the checkered board. And uh, here Robby has a task, which is uh, uh, following uh, this path here. And uh, Robby by itself does nothing. But uh, if uh, Robby has an instruction, then it can uh, execute uh, this instruction and makes a step. This instruction has a precise meaning, uh, which means uh, go ahead. And uh, if Robby has a program instead of an instruction, just uh, several instructions in sequence, uh, then it can uh, read, interpret, and execute the instruction one at a time and go ahead, go ahead, turn right, and go ahead and perform the task. Is it intelligent? Probably this is not. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that it is not. But in any case, Robbie by itself, for sure, <laughs> is not intelligent at all. But with Cody, who is the programmer, the coder, it becomes <laughs> maybe a little bit more intelligent or at least capable of accomplishing a task. So the language uh, is basically uh, represented by these uh, three cards, turn left, go ahead, turn right, which represent the lexicon and also the syntax, uh, because uh, this, you see, this um, tips here and this uh, uh, small holes here are uh, like uh, puzzle tiles uh, that, can, uh, that can fit into each other. And the syntax uh, uh, is just that. So if, if you can make them fit, this means that you can combine them in sequence and that's it. So this is very similar to what happens with Scratch with, um, with what is called uh, visual programming. And um, this is the semantics. So tar left means that uh, uh, starting from the original position, uh, Robbie turns uh, 90 degrees uh, to its left. Uh, move ahead means uh, uh, move on the, on the uh, square um, above it. And turn right means uh, 90 degree clockwise. So what makes uh, uh, Robbie able to execute the code? The fact that it contains a microprocessor. And it is useful to point out that even if we have a robot, uh, the only programmable part is the microprocessor. And this is uh, thanks to many contributions. One of the, the main contribution that I'd like to point out uh, is the one by John von Neumann, because he conceived an architecture which is still the architecture all computer systems are based on. And uh, it, its contribution can be um, told in a few words because uh, it basically conceived the fact that any microprocessor also needs a memory because uh, the memory needs to store a program in order to make the instructions available to the microprocessor because the microprocessor does nothing without an instruction to execute. And, uh, Previous contribution was by Alan Turing, and the Turing machine is uh, for sure one of the conceptual machines uh, that uh, paved the way to informatics. But right now, I'd like to point out that in order to make uh, any kind of robot work, we have hardware, software, but we also have inputs, outputs, sensor, and actuators. And uh, well, we can go back uh, to, um, to the um, uh, 19th century, where we found Babbage and Ada Lovelace. And uh, this is just to say that the separation between hardware and software uh, came from them. And uh, Ada is known to, to be the first computer programmer, even if there were no computers at their age. And this um, tells us a lot 
about what computational thinking is because in order to write a program we don't need to have a computer we need just to be able to think as if we had a computer which is something completely different and uh, if we put uh, uh, software and hardware together then Robbie apparently becomes able to accomplish a task but only if we try to change the task and we see that uh, Robbie keeps performing the previous one we understand that it is not so intelligent and then we uh, can also try to provide the wrong program to Robbie and once again it won't be able to accomplish a task but if we consider that the software is in memory and we assume that Robbie has the program in its own memory then at some point uh, we uh, can uh, perceive Robbie as intelligent as long as the program uh, it has in memory is the one that solves the task that we want Robbie to perform. So what I mean is that uh, if we don't perceive the fact that Robbie is uh, reading, uh, um, interpreting and executing instructions one at a time, and we just look at the robot performing a task, it is quite different for us from outside a robot without knowing the architecture to decide whether or not uh, it is intelligent. But so far the intelligence is the intelligence of the coder, not the intelligence of the robot. What we can do at some point is testing it to see that it's not performing very well, but if we take advantage of sensors, then we can make it uh, uh, context aware and able to adapt. But sensors are not enough. We need also to uh, move from linear code to constructs, to coding constructs, to computer programming constructs, like for instance, repetition. Repetition says uh, repeat until you reach this uh, yellow uh, circle and the instruction that Robbie has to repeat is this one and in this case uh, Robbie can uh, perform this task but can perform also this one if we add another construct I'm not explaining uh, these cards in detail because this is not the main focus but I would like to point out that we if we keep introducing programming constructs of repetition and selection, then the same robot, which is still able only to execute code, becomes able to adapt to the context. And in this case, it will be able to reach this point and to reach any other point along this path if we move this yellow circle somewhere else. And if we keep making it uh, more complex. This is still code. This is not uh, artificial intelligence. It's still code, but our robot becomes able to adapt to the environment. Is it universal enough? This kind of path can be solved. This kind of, of path can be solved by the same code. So right now I'm considering Robbie as a robot who has in its own memory this piece of code that can be represented by simple cards. So this is really the uh, simplest uh, uh, method that I <laughs> were, was able to conceive in order to explain how uh, computing uh, and programming work, but still it is able to adapt to these many paths and find at some point uh, the yellow circle. But if I make this other example, it fails. So I need something else to make it uh, a little bit more intelligence and uh, even if this could sound strange I need um, to add pseudo random numbers. I need to make its behavior non-determinist in order not deterministic in order to make it able to solve more problems than the ones that it was able to solve. So this card represents uh, an arbitrary a random move and if I make it uh, able to move randomly as long as uh, it reaches it does not reach 
the yellow circle, at some point, uh, it will for sure reach the yellow circle. But I'm not able to uh, foresee the path that it will follow, and I'm not able to see how long it will take to reach the yellow circle. What is nice is that at this point, uh, even if uh, I was the programmer, I was coding, the behavior of Robbie is something that uh, is surprising for me as for any other user of Robbie or for any other observer, because there is some non-determinism which has been uh, uh, implemented within the robot. And this is one of the key point that uh, any entity in order to um, be perceived as intelligent, as uh, able of um, basically uh, following uh, its own free will has to be non-deterministic in nature or otherwise there will be always someone able to predict step by step its path and to point out that it is not intelligent but just executing the code that someone else wrote. But still, this is not intelligence. Um, those are examples in which we can make it a little bit more intelligent by combining uh, the random moves uh, with the previous steps and so on. But at some point, we need something else, with it, which is a speed. And speed is something which makes many machines uh, uh, apparently intelligent, like the ones that can win by playing chess or by playing tic-tac-toe or so on. But just because they are able to um, basically evaluate all the possible moves, and take the best one. This is called the brute force, just because they are not actually following an algorithm or um, any intuition or any form of intelligence, but just computational speed. And as long as computational speed uh, is uh, uh, fast enough to allow uh, these kind of computers uh, to take decision in such a short time that for us, are compatible with our reasoning, then they will look intelligence at some point, also overcome the intelligence of human being contrasting them. And this, there are many examples, of course, can be made, uh, very simple examples can be made and fully explained. Uh, Tic-tac-toe is much better than chess to this purpose and, and so on. Um, but now we need something else. And what we need is learning. Learning can be provided by adding neural networks, for instance, to the, to the robot. And this will make them able to classify objects. In this case, uh, each of them is an example of a, of a picture which has a background and two foreground uh, shapes. And um, here they are distributed according to um, on a Cartesian plane where the x-axis um, represents the light of the background and uh, the y-axis represents the light of the foreground. And uh, if we ask um, an artificial intelligence uh, entity like uh, a neural network to uh, take uh, all the pictures where the foreground is uh, darker than the background, then it will uh, take uh, all the ones that I highlighted in red with no, um, with no effort uh, and with no error, but just because the features uh, which are the light of the background and the light of the foreground were very well defined. And it was up to us to provide these two features and to make the machine able to extract these two features 
before trying to interpret uh, what we were asking uh, it to do. So what I mean is that uh, when we uh, have um, neural networks, which, has, which are one of the main uh, techniques uh, to um, make uh, artificial intelligent uh, systems, uh, we uh, cannot use them as black boxes, but we need to uh, deeply understand the problem that we want the uh, artificial intelligence system uh, to face uh, in order to provide uh, the means uh, for uh, uh, really solving the problem. And if we provide the wrong uh, features, like for instance, the shape of the objects and then, uh, so assume that the shapes, uh, sorry, the features that I extracted are the one, so the light in the background and the light in the foreground. And then I ask uh, this machine to classify objects uh, based uh, on the relationship between the two shapes uh, of the two um, images that, uh, sorry, the two shapes uh, that um, each image contains, uh, then the features that I, uh, provided, which are the light in the foreground and background will be completely useless and the same neural network will fail in trying to uh, classify objects based on something else, like for instance, the circle to the right uh, of the square or vice versa, even if uh, they seem very simple to us. And basically, this kind of classification uh, uh, works very, very well when it is fairly easy in uh, a plane or in a space, uh, the uh, coordinates of which are the feature to isolate the class that we want uh, the machine to automatically classify. And as long as the classification criterion uh, is compatible with the features that we provided, the machine will be able to classify even uh, something which is completely different from what we provided as a training set. So in this case, uh, this image here will be um, properly classified as uh, one of the images where the foreground is darker than the background as it is, even if it contains a triangle and our neural network uh, had never seen a triangle before. Okay, uh, to conclude, I, I'd like just uh, to um, point out uh, three ways uh, in which uh, these concepts can be tested very easily and at any age and we, without uh, any type of uh, previous background on uh, artificial intelligence. So an unplugged game where we divide, uh, for instance, uh, a group of people in two, or we take uh, one uh, out of a, um, of a group and we decide a, a rule to classify these cards and we provide cards. Those could be printed out and used physically. And we, we ask the person who, who does not know the criterion to try to understand what the criterion is. And we just provide examples. And by doing so, we uh, make this person behave uh, as uh, if uh, it uh, was, uh, he or her was uh, an artificial intelligence engine uh, uh, based on neural networks uh, um, during uh, um, a training phase. The other uh, ways in which we can uh, play with it uh, is uh, by using code.org AI which is a, a, a fairly simple activity that provides to a robot uh, a lot of uh, examples. And it is up to us uh, to decide how to classify the examples. And based on the way in which we classify the examples during the training phase, when we decide that the training uh, is uh, over, then the robot will keep classifying objects uh, according to the criterion that we provided. And it is uh, interesting in this case uh, to see how the accuracy of the automatic decision taken by the robot uh, depends on the, um, uh, on the richness of the training set uh, and also on the accuracy of our own decisions during the training phase. Because 
it will learn from our error or from our uh, good examples. And another very uh, interesting uh, tool is uh, the playground of TensorFlow. This is a neural network. These uh, are uh, examples that we want to classify. And those are the features that are extracted automatically. And those are the neurons uh, that uh, will uh, be adapted during the training set. The training in this case is uh, performed automatically and uh, we can play with it by adding neurons, uh, adding layers, uh, adding neurons to each layer, adding features and so on. And we can see by making it run uh, how these neural networks becomes able to distinguish the yellow from the blue dots. And we can, once, for instance, uh, this neural network has learned to classify the, the, um, the points distributed as in, as in this figure, we could try to change the inputs and to see that the network has to readapt completely and to learn from scratch. Because learning is based on what? Learning is based on the weights of these links between neurons on different layers. So starting from this layer, which is the input layer where the features are provided to the network, there are many possible layers in deep learning. There are many, many, many layers that uh, are used to combine these features. Each neuron takes many inputs and provide one, out one output. And the function that it, uh, that it implements is adapted over time just by changing the weights of the links. The weights changes according to the examples that we provide in order to make uh, it work as, um, as good as possible on the training set, okay? So I'm sorry if I uh, provided too, too many inputs uh, on uh, too many <laughs> disciplines uh, and uh, by speaking in uh, trivial words uh, without uh, going into the details of anything. So I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> it was on purpose. I, I did it on purpose. <laughs> See. No, that's, that's great. Uh, because you gave a lot of this, lot of input. It's good for us to brainstorm now and looking for more information, learn more. It's just great. Okay. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for uh, being here, for accepting also to change the day. I'm sorry about that, but uh, unfortunately this weekend I couldn't make it. And I apologize. No, that, that's, that's great. And uh, I'm sure that we have a lot of people wanting to make questions. Uh, if you could give more of your time to us, please. So who wants to, to, to start? Can I, can I start? Sure. Um, I love how you try to explain everything using simple and even employ examples. Actually, I think we need more explanations about uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence like that, because usually uh, people try to get uh, in too many details and for us that are not experts, it makes a huge difference when we see very simple examples. And uh, I also love how you started with uh, the history and biological aspects before entering into technology. Uh, and even uh, went further talking about ethics, economy, economy and society. I really appreciate that it wasn't, I was expecting a technical explanation today, and I got really overwhelmed about how uh, how do I say uh, the, the how deep and also how 
forgot the word for them. Bre Large. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yes. Actually, I don't have a, a question, just a curiosity. I, I saw that you mentioned a lot of Italian authors. Uh, is the Italians uh, like a reference in artificial intelligence? Yeah, uh, it was it was just because the the MOOC that I mentioned that I organized was uh, um, targeting Italian teachers in order to provide them an overview of what uh, artificial intelligence is because I am uh, used to uh, run MOOCs for Italian teachers uh, for free uh, and uh, just to make them aware of topics that then can be to some extent uh, also um, uh, provided to their kids uh, even if they are primary school teachers or secondary school teachers or teachers of any discipline so this is a uh, something that I started with coding uh, and that uh, why they keep uh, following this kind of uh, of, um, of uh, in multidisciplinary MOOCs. And by the way, I find it uh, very interesting to organize them because I can listen to many people <laughs> speaking about uh, aspects that I didn't know before <laughs> before actually running the MOOC. So I would say that I am the first user of the MOOCs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, quite um, um, embarrassed to uh, speak about uh, um, basically uh, topics that I don't master, like uh, many of the ones that I mentioned. But I wanted just to provide an overview based uh, on uh, this uh, um, uh, these, um, contributions that I collected, uh, just to, um, uh, I would say, suggest to speak as much as possible to people uh, with different backgrounds about these topics, because it's uh, really, really interesting, in particular, the, the, um, there were some aspects that were really, you know, opening my mind when I heard the people speaking with true competencies on that <laughs> specific topic. Uh, that's uh, the idea. That's why I, I, I'd like to, you to to talk to us to to share this whole. Yeah. Um, Luisa, I'm sorry, but I, I have to switch to my smartphone because uh, I risk to be locked in because I am still at university. And since uh, at uh, uh, half past nine, I know that they will lock the main door. So I have to switch to, to my smartphone to keep uh, answering your question if you have. So. Okay. Please uh, uh, let me just join. Yes, take your time. Yeah, uh, you can speak. I can <laughs> listen. To okay, you. Uh, maybe Adele, Bob, you have some questions. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. And uh, um, the thing, for example, one thing I really love is the unplugged activity, uh, because you know AI is a new field. And uh, we need really a lot. We, any new idea to teach AI in an easy way is always welcome. So for me, it's always interesting to, to see uh, a, any new way of teaching. So I have uh, a question about uh, the, um, uh, the bias and the social impact. How do you teach this? How, I mean, how, how, how is your way to teach uh, this in this uh, MOOC? Is it like a presentation or I wanted to know about this. how do you teach bias and social impact and so on? Yes. Um, well, I'm not really <laughs> teaching biases. <laughs> but I'm uh, uh, just uh, trying to raise awareness uh, on the bias. But for instance, the, um, all the examples that I made, uh, in particular, the one from code.org and the <laughs> that I mentioned, can be used to uh, provide examples of what a bias is. 
because uh, we can, uh, for instance, uh, the um, activity by code.org shows uh, a lot of different uh, fishes or, um, or um, animals uh, uh, that uh, we can find uh, um, in the sea in order to try to save them uh, while uh, uh, collecting, um, collecting uh, uh, what uh, uh, shouldn't be in the oceans. And uh, if we provide just uh, examples that are all of the same kind, like for instance, triangular uh, fishes or so on, the only ones that will be saved will be the ones that we provided as examples. So it's fairly simple to make uh, even very small kids uh, able to uh, understand what a bias is. Thank you so much. It's it's clear. Uh, just one more point. Maybe I, I I really wanted to 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 hear the conversation between teachers between your students, because I know that exposing this kind of new technologies to personal to people from not uh, technical background, from not uh, computer science, they will give you a lot of new ideas, a new perspective, new ways of seeing the technology. And personally, I really love. Uh, listening to these kind of people because they they really show you a new way. Oh, I didn't think about this. So, uh, are you planning to do like? Uh, did you plan uh, like uh, um, meeting like video meetings uh, in this MOOC? Do you organize this uh, kind of meeting? Well, uh, the MOOC is over right now, but mm -hmm. I I will uh, um, I can uh, collect feedback from uh, the mm -hmm. teachers. Uh, and uh, through the teachers from their kids, because I have a, a very active community of teachers, uh, uh, who is called uh, Code MOOC, Coding in Your Classroom Now, was the original name of the first MOOC that uh, the teachers um, mm -hmm. followed the University of Urbino. So I can really get uh, feedbacks from them. And if we, we want to, even conceive some form of a questionnaire or a survey or whatever, uh, we can even uh, submit it to the ones who took the MOOC, for instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'd be also happy to share the um, methods like Kodi Robi or Unplugged because I like Unplugged methods a lot in particular because of their uh, inclusiveness uh, and the fact that they do not uh, raise um, uh, raise uh, technical barriers. And uh, about the, the coding part, do you go uh, deep inside the coding part or just what are the tools that you use in the coding part? Yeah, for coding, I, I mainly use, uh, for explaining uh, concepts from scratch, I use uh, the um, mainly uh, unplugged coding activities as much as possible. When I cannot uh, do it unplugged, I do it in a different way, like, uh, for instance, uh, using code.org, so computer visual uh, programming tools, uh, or uh, uh, like the playground of TensorFlow for explaining other concepts. But uh, I try to use as much as possible either online activities uh, or unplugged activities. All right, thank you. Hello, Alejandro. Yep. Hi, uh, this is Borvi from India. Hi. Uh, I, I just like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, really gave uh, us a lot of um, me a lot of insights into how you know how how you are teaching AI using an unplugged way. Uh, thank you very much for like giving a very interesting introduction to uh, you know how how uh, you know, sometimes we forget that AI is also based on uh, human uh, you know neurobiology. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Adel Kasa has covered uh, most of my questions. So I just want to say thank you, and um, we thank hope to Appreciate communicate it. with you further in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you once again to Eliza for, for organizing this.
and uh, thank you for and uh, greetings everyone also in the group thank you sir thank you anders um you see me twice uh, correct so i should be yes. able to switch because otherwise i really risk to but be it's worthy <laughs> <laughs> Let me. So much you told us that it's for two. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, Roberto and Anders, maybe you would like to say something? Hello. Hello. Um, all my questions are answered, but I, I think it's it's a great presentation. If you don't uh, know anything about AI, and you presented so I understand. So I, I think it's great. A little bit too too late maybe, but. Uh, <laughs> Very great. I understand the mock was for teachers. You muted. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was uh, not only for teachers, but unfortunately, it was in Italian. <laughs> hmm. So I'd like to, to, to thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Alessandro. This uh, has been recorded, so it will be available on our website soon. And I'm sure that a lot of other uh, colleagues and friends are be grateful for having the opportunity of uh, learning about this. I in the meantime, uh, <laughs> I bring uh, with me. <laughs> so, thank you for everybody for being here. And I hope to see you again on the next, next presentation later this month. Okay? Thank bye you very bye. Much. Thank you, Alison. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you so bye much. Bye. 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 Ciao. He's leaving. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Hora della pasta. <laughs> ciao. Ciao, ciao.